All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dallas, to the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. My name is Stephen Fagan. I'm the curator here at the museum, and we're very pleased that you could join us today on Veterans Day for this special uh, living history presentation. Uh, we're coming to you live from the Texas School Book Depository here in Dealey Plaza at the site of the assassination. In fact, I will uh, show you a picture of the building that we are coming to you live from. There it is, a very famous structure uh, built in 1901. Uh, this is the warehouse, the school distribution textbook warehouse, where uh, evidence was found on the sixth floor suggesting that shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade almost 54 years ago on November 22nd, 1963. We have a great program in store for you today. We do ask uh, if all of our schools were connected to multiple uh, schools and organizations today for this presentation. We ask that all of you mute your microphones at this time if you haven't done so already. And then the uh, four schools that we have outlined for interactivity will uh, call on you individually by name towards the end of the program and then you can ask questions of our guest speaker. And with that, I want to introduce uh, uh, this fine gentleman sitting next to me. This is Tracy Rowlett. And if you grew up or spent any time in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, any time between the mid-70s and about 2008, uh, Tracy Rowlett was one of the most recognized faces on local television. He was a broadcast journalist first at the ABC affiliate, WFAA-TV, from 1974 to 1999. And then he moved over to the CBS affiliate and was there from 2000 to 2008. So a very long, diverse career in journalism, during which time you won over 100 awards, as I understand it. I, you know, I don't know who the judges were for those things, but obviously I paid them enough money. Well, I didn't know there were 100 different journalistic <laughs> awards, but I feel like you got every one of them. But very recognized face. For me personally, I'm a Dallas side. I grew up watching this gentleman every night on television. So it's a real honor to uh, get to share this, uh, this moment and talk a little bit about the 60s, the assassination, and the aftermath. So, Tracy, let's go back and actually start off by showing these folks what you looked like <laughs> way back in the day. So here you are. Have it changed a bit? No, no. I, I, uh, I exactly the same person. Yeah. So uh, this is you from around uh, j just after high school graduation, early years in college. Yeah, my first year in college. Uh, I, I actually had gone uh, to college for a year and played some football and mm -hmm. thought I was pretty hot stuff. And then. Uh, things were happening in my life and I dropped out. We had a military obligation in those days, Stephen, and so I went into the Air Force then Okay. For after one year of college. But that was my first year in college. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about your uh, service in the U.S. Air Force today, but let's start actually with President Kennedy. That 1960 election, very close race between John F. Kennedy, the Democrat, and Richard Nixon, the Republican. What what memories do you have as a young man of that that historic election? Well, I have I have several memories. One of the things that comes, I think, immediately to mind, considering the fact that we're doing a television production here by all of uh, uh, by, uh, by at least the outcome of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, for the first time we had these presidential debates between Nixon and Kennedy. And I think that for the first time we were able to see that the, uh, the way a candidate looked on the air had a tremendous impact on voters. And Kennedy, frankly, was able to outshine Nixon, I think, in those debates. Nixon always had a problem, even after years later after he mm -hmm. became president, He'd break out into sweat sometimes, especially on his upper lip, and that was uh, disconcerting to a lot of folks. He did it in the debates, and Kennedy just simply had a lot more style and was a lot more comfortable with the cameras. Mm -hmm. So previous presidents, I'm thinking Herbert Hoover or Warren G. Oh, yeah. Harding, they might have had a harder time getting elected president uh, if the voters could have actually seen them. Well, as, yeah. as opposed to hearing them on the radio or things like that. Well, think about people like Abraham Lincoln, who was described repeatedly as being a, not a very attractive man, <laughs> uh, Washington, who was pockmarked, and so forth. And yes, it's probably true that these folks, our greatest presidents perhaps, 
could not be elected uh, today. That's interesting. The impact that television really began to take That's take true. take form in the early '60s. Now, in this photograph we're looking at, you can see Senator Kennedy and Vice President Nixon at that very first debate. That was a very decisive debate that. Uh, leaned in Kennedy's favor, at least for those watching television. That's right. Uh, we're also looking at a picture of a Kennedy rally, this one in Fort Worth, but you, living uh, in Kansas at the time, you got to attend a Kennedy rally. Well, with my mother. My mother was uh, an early, I mean, uh, probably when Kennedy was still uh, running for the Senate, she became uh, enamored of Kennedy and the whole uh, Kennedy aura. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she was an ardent fan. And so she wanted to see this rally. And uh, we went to the rally there in uh, Wichita, Kansas, at a place called Lawrence Stadium, a big outdoor rally. And folks just packed it, uh, and packed it in at that place. And Kansas is one of the most, back then even, yeah. was one of the most Republican states uh, in the country. So to have that kind of turnout probably was boding well for Kennedy. Mm -hmm. He didn't win Kansas, but still, there was a great deal of uh, support there. There was, and there were people in Kansas who went to work in campaigns in other states. Mm -hmm. So they did have an impact. Now, Kennedy's Catholicism, being uh, the first Catholic president elected, right. that was a major campaign issue. We don't really think much about that today, or young people might not be aware of it, but do you remember there being concerns about Kennedy's Catholicism? Oh, absolutely. Tremendous concerns about how Kennedy was going to have to answer directly to the, pro, uh, to the Pope and various social things, birth control and so forth, mm -hmm. just couldn't be discussed at all because that would be anathema to the Catholic Church. It was a... Uh, it was a huge issue, at least as presented by Kennedy's opponents. Right. Well, of course, he, he won the election, barely, but he did win the election. And here's a nice picture of Kennedy, actually the day before the assassination when he's in uh, Houston. And, you know, we see this image, and Jackie is there in the background, this young, attractive, almost Hollywood-esque couple. Yeah. Um, very vibrant. Uh, compared, for example, to Dwight Eisenhower, the oldest president in American history up to that time, Kennedy, the youngest elected, young kids in the White House. As a young man, were you sort of swept up in the excitement of this era? I think that, uh, I think that we all were. I think that there was a, a sort of a revitalization. And... Uh, Kennedy was a very good public speaker, and uh, when he was giving his speeches uh, right after the election, I mean, I think we we're all just enthralled by it. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I think that Eisenhower, of course, had been a five-star general in charge of our European forces and so forth, but uh, Eisenhower had a lot of respect, but it was from an earlier generation. And one of the things that Kennedy landed upon was this new generation that's taking right. over. So he pushed that, and he did it very well. Interesting that that shift uh, to this younger generation, this future generation of Americans, occurred right around the same time that television was becoming more exactly. prominent. It, there was this shift, not just in history, but in culture as well. And, and you were sort of caught right there at, the, at ground zero of that, being the age you were at the time. That's true, and my friends and I were all just ardent Kennedy supporters. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that at that age we were completely informed about the, uh, the competing issues, but we just liked him. And there was a, a charisma about Kennedy that I don't think we've seen with any other president. Now, we just marked last month the 55th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis from October of 1962, the closest uh, we have ever come thus far to nuclear war. It's a hot topic to discuss today because uh, we're still talking about nuclear war at this very moment in time in 2017. This is a startling graphic uh, produced by the Department of Defense in 62 showing the range of Soviet missiles stationed in or installed in Havana basically covering the entirety of the United States. It's a frightening uh, graphic. Now, you were serving in the U.S. Air Force at this time. I was. Uh, what was this experience like for you as a serviceman? I remember it very well because we were all uh, just uh, very much on edge. We had to be. Uh, I was stationed at uh, Great Falls, Montana at an, at an Air Force base called Malmstrom Air Force Base. It's still there today. Malmstrom was the first home of the operation, of the first operational home of the Minuteman missile. It was a breakthrough missile complex. It had uh, the first the missiles that were actually installed in deep silos and so forth. Uh, and we knew that we were one of the top targets for the Soviets. 
So even though I was the editor of a base newspaper, I was nevertheless given a rifle and told to go out and sandbag the command post and march around on a a flight line, uh, fearing, I guess, that we were going to have some kind of a direct uh, uh, attack on the United States. We did believe that that might happen, and those were very tense days. Very, Very few of us were able to sleep through them. And if it did happen, if the sirens went off, it was nuclear war, what would you have been told to do, do you think? Well, they, you know, we, we uh, had uh, little badges that would indicate whether or not we had somehow, you know, succumbed to, to, to the nuclear uh, 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 radiation, radioactivity detection? and so okay. forth, yeah. So we had those things. But basically, I think we were just going to sit out there and get killed because there wasn't any real plan to try to save us. But let's be fair here. Montana was quite a ways off. And we knew, if you look again at that map, you can see that we would have been on the probably toward the outer edge of what their missile uh, defense capability would have been. And uh, growing up in Kansas a decade earlier, you were doing uh, duck and cover drills in elementary school, getting under your desk. Yeah, we had uh, television uh, spots that would say exactly that, duck and cover. And we actually had to jump under our desk. Now think about that. If we had a (laughs) nuclear attack, Jumping under your desk as a little kid is probably going to do what? Yeah. Not much. Yeah. But that's what we did. That's yeah. What we practiced. A, a frightening time. Do you think, looking back on the way Kennedy handled the Cuban Missile Crisis and considering the uh, political atmosphere that we're in today in 2017, are there lessons that we can learn from how Kennedy handled that situation? I think so. I think that one thing that we always should uh, be uh, watching is just exactly how our leaders uh, present the arguments for the United States. In other words, we're looking right now at North Korea. Mm -hmm. Is it right or is it wrong that uh, President Trump uh, says, uh, you know, calls calls, uh, the head of of Korea rocket man? I mean, little rocket man. Little rocket man. I mean, do you want to really insult these people and get them all upset? I think Kennedy had a different point of view. Now, I also think that Khrushchev, who, of course, at that time was the premier of the Soviet Union, uh, had very little respect for Kennedy. Kennedy, in his early mm-hmm. 40s, probably, at least in Khrushchev's mind, did not have the gravitas, did not have the experience uh, to be able to take over a country like this and to stand up to the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Now, Kennedy did, and there are great stories and books that have been written about all of this. But, yes, I think the way we conduct ourselves vis-a-vis other countries has has a tremendous impact. A missed opportunity that Kennedy didn't have access to Twitter, I suppose. Yeah, well, I don't... <laughs> Might have given us some great insight into what was going on. I, somehow I don't think Kennedy would be using uh, Twitter, even if it had been, but... <laughs> That's now, my point of view. Now, at the time of the assassination, you were not in the United States. You have a very unique perspective. I'm going to put this map on the screen so you can set the sa- stage for us. But you were uh, in North Africa, specifically in Libya. And then at the very top of Libya there, uh, outlined in a little square, is Tripoli. And that is where you were stationed. Uh, now, how did you get there? Because I understand before you went there, you actually volunteered for Vietnam. I did. And Vietnam was just starting to become a real shooting war. And I, as I say, I was in Montana, and I didn't want to spend my entire enlistment uh, as, a, as a newspaper editor in, in Great Falls, Montana. So I started putting in volunteer statements, and one of those statements went to uh, Vietnam. And I was just ready to go to Southeast Asia, but the Air Force, in its wisdom, decided that it would send me first to Germany and then detach me back down to Libya. Mm -hmm. So that's how I wound up in Libya. Now, as far as the political climate, the situation, this is going to take a little explanation on your part because I don't think anyone watching this or in this room other than you really understands the role and the importance of of Libya at that time with bordering Egypt. Can you give us a little sense of uh, the way it was at that time? Yeah, I, you'll notice that, uh, that uh, that's a rather long border uh, there with Egypt. Now, coming out of World War II, we were very close uh, to the Libyan uh, king, King Idris. And the Italians actually had opened the base that later became Wheelis Air Base in Tripoli. And it was used against American and British forces during the war. But um, as the war, as actually as the Italians dropped out of the war, Uh, we took that base over. And um, it was extremely important because of where it was. Uh, 
it was a real listening post for everything that was happening. Next door in Egypt, the uh, dictator there was a fellow named uh, Gamal Abder, uh, Abdel Nasser. And he was calling, much as we hear today, he was calling then for a unified uh, Middle East. He wanted all of the Arab countries mm -hmm. to unify, and he was very much uh, for the Soviets and not for the West. So we were very critically placed. Uh, Nasser was calling for uh, Libya to join the, the uh, Arab Republic, as he called it. Uh, Syria had joined. There were other people who were very interested. And this was considered a hypersensitive area. And those of us who were in broadcasting at that time were handpicked to go down there. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of pictures that you've provided from Wheelis. So uh, there's, a, there's <laughs> a little welcome to Wheelis uh, sign, I'm guessing. But I love the picture at top there. Now, did, did you, I have to ask you, did you ever get to ride a camel while you were I did ride a camel. And uh, the darn things were pretty mean, I'll tell you that. They'd spit at you and bite you, too. You had to be careful with them. <laughs> But being young airmen, you know, we'd try just about anything. But that wasn't your primary mode of transportation, I not, guess. Uh, not really, no. Okay. We uh, we did ride a few, but just uh, just because we thought it was kick, you know, <laughs> a fun thing to do. Go now, on. now, with you working for broadcasting, essentially, with you doing journalism there at Wheelis, and because it was such a sensitive political area, I'm assuming pretty much every word you wrote had to be cleared. Yeah, we had uh, even our... Um, even our wire services came in in a code, uh, kind of a rudimentary code, the easiest way to explain it. Uh, letters and numbers corresponded. So if it, it all came in in numbers, and then you, the, somebody would have to translate all that stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, we did not always air everything that was coming over the Associated Press, even though it was a legitimate story. But because we were in a hypersensitive area, there were the, the government felt that we should take uh, precautions and probably not just say every darn thing about what was happening in the world. Uh, so is there, is there an example of some sensitive story that was not appropriate at the time? Again, remembering that Nasser was a very influential person, and there were tremendous things that were happening uh, with Nasser vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, as the there were uh, there were a lot of oil concerns with a lot of Americans who worked in Libya to help them with develop their oil, and uh, they had schools, and the schools had inflatable globes that came in, and what would happen is that um, as those things were coming in, the Libyans would stand there and literally cut Israel out. Well, then an inflatable globe, once Israel was cut out of it, didn't inflate anymore. So they finally worked out a deal so that um, teachers would go down to, to the uh, uh, customs area. These things were coming in, and they took little black markers, and they would mark out Israel. I mean, that's how sensitive it was. So, uh, and then the globes would still work, and then the teachers would say, well, that blacked out part is Israel. So I don't know how much was accomplished. But, uh, but yeah, because of that kind of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, those stories, because we didn't want to infuriate our host country, uh, were sometimes eliminated. And, and it's also true that the U.S. rarely stationed Jewish soldiers. That's true. It's absolutely true. They tried, uh, I don't think we had any in broadcasting, at least in North Africa. I don't think, I don't think that any of the people with whom I worked uh, were, were, uh, were Jews. I mm -hmm. think that yeah, the other folks were handpicked. They had, perhaps on the base itself, there were folks mm -hmm. uh, who were Jewish, but I don't, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Now, you did primarily radio, but you also did a little bit of television coverage. We have a picture of you at your set uh, there in, in Tripoli. And what a set it is. I love this photograph. This looks like something I would have mocked up in my... Uh, Dan, when I was going to give the news, but yeah, uh, no. it, it really is something, and it, I think it speaks to the time and probably the very limited budget you were on. Yeah, you know, the, <laughs> the Air Force would cut a few corners where it could. <laughs> uh, I had a friend of mine say, boy, the books were a nice touch. Yeah. You know, it made us look like very we read. Scholarly. Yeah. I looked like I just had read too much and dozed off in this picture. <laughs> My eyes are shut. That happens sometimes, you know. It's interesting, though, you're wearing uniform while yeah. giving, and then that was standard. You would. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, at, as I was leaving there, they came out with blazers with uh, the crest, the Air Force crest that would be on the blazer, but I didn't, I didn't have one of those. I, we went on in uniform. 
did you have much interaction with the CIA? Uh, after the Kennedy assassination, we had a lot of interaction with the CIA. <clears throat> excuse me, but at the time, uh, just occasionally they would come in. Excuse me, I'm going to grab a little water here. I'm starting to get a little dry. But uh, we had the second largest uh, UN peacekeeping force was in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a huge contingent of, uh, as you can imagine, again, looking at where we were, and that we had all this listening stuff that was stuck all over the country. Uh, so yeah, we had a lot of CIA people who, mm -hmm. who were there doing these things. A lot of folks uh, with our government. Yeah, I'll let you get a drink right, here while sorry I ask my <clears throat> next question. In fact, I'm going to put a picture up on the screen from Dallas, November 22nd. This is actually right outside where we're broadcasting. This is the moment the first shot was fired, captured by an eyewitness. Now, it's daytime. It's 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas. But over in Tripoli, it was nighttime. It was nighttime, and I was on air actually giving insert newscasts in a football game that we were broadcasting that night from the base. And, um, it, 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 uh, I, you know, it was just one of those typical evenings where you don't think you're going to have a whole lot to do. We had, a, we had a young engineer who was decoding all of the wire services as they came in. And he came running into me and he said, Tracy, we've got some really bad stuff that's happening right now. What do you want to do with it? And without calling anyone, and again, remembering it's a hypersensitive area, we'd been working with generals and others to try to determine what we could put on the air. I simply keyed the mic in the middle of this football game and I said, Kennedy has been shot in Dallas. And then as these bulletins were coming in and the, and the young engineer kept breaking them down for us, and I went on the air. Well, what had happened, too, was that so many people in those days carried those little radios with them so that they could hear the the play-by-play uh, -play for the football game, right? So people in the stands, those who had radios, were turning to their friends and saying, hey, you're not going to believe this, and here's what's happening in Dallas. And uh, pretty soon they called a halt to, to the football game. The players just stood around. And everybody was listening to us. They put us on a speaker so that they could actually hear what we were putting out on the air. And, um, I mean, suddenly we were descended upon like you can't believe. And as these things kept coming in, and ultimately we learned that Kennedy was, in fact, killed. Uh, and this business was coming. I mean, it was unfolding. Even though we didn't have the pictures to supplement what we were doing, this was all on radio. But uh, it was, uh, for lack of a better term, it was pretty exciting stuff. And it was very uh, captivating to the audience. Everybody wanted to hear what was happening in Dallas. And it's, it's worth emphasizing that you broke the story of the Kennedy assassination for a big chunk of the Middle East. Yeah, for a large part of the Middle East. And our, our uh, signal also got up into uh, southern Europe. So um, as the days went by, we were just overwhelmed. I had always thought that probably I'd go into newspaper work, but it was the impact that we had uh, with the Kennedy assassination that made me make the choice that I wanted to go into broadcast news, not print news. But it was just overwhelming, and we didn't sleep for several days. As I say, we were descended upon by generals and colonels and yeah. people from the CIA. And, and they weren't very happy with you. No, because I hadn't cleared any of this, you <laughs> see. I just started going on the air with these bulletins, as we would in the United States. And so I had a couple of very high-ranking people, a general, who braced me out in the hall and, you know, chewed me out pretty good for not contacting anybody. But then, because we were doing continuous coverage, they let me to go to go back in and, mm -hmm. and continue what we were doing. We didn't sleep for the next three days and nights, maybe grabbing just short naps where we could at the station. But uh, it was a really how many other time. broadcasters were you rotating with? Well, that's a good question. I uh, I suppose we probably had about uh, ten people who were actually on the air mm -hmm. doing everything television and. Then we had other folks who were behind the scenes who were running the cameras right. and so forth. Right. Now, this is a conspiratorial question that I know will come up. Um, were you ever told at any time by the CIA or by any sort of military intelligence that you had to tell the story this way, you had to emphasize Oswald as the lone gunman? No. I Actually, 
the interesting thing about that is that while there were previous to this uh, people who were there telling us what we could put on the air and couldn't put on the air, uh, during this thing they left us alone and we did the bulletins. Now remembering that we didn't, ex that we didn't have direct live capabilities with the states in those days. So our television signal, as an example, was just simply for that area, right? We couldn't connect with the United States. So things were shipped in like a day late. They got them to us as quickly as they could. But all of the broadcasts that were taking place in the states from the networks, mm -hmm. we then would air the following day. So we had all of the information, but they didn't try to come in and you know, cut segments out or anything. We put it on just as it was in the United States. I'm going to put a picture up on the screen of Lee Harvey Oswald in police custody. Of course, he shot uh, in Dallas police headquarters right. uh, about 48 hours after the Kennedy assassination. Uh, you're covering this as well. Do you remember right. how you got word of this shooting in Dallas? Yeah, because we did have, you know, the wires that were coming in. So we knew about that as soon as it happened. And I remember there was just sort of a gasp and we were, we were just, oh my God, you know, how could this possibly take place mm -hmm. and uh, we were very concerned about how that would then play in the Middle East especially um, but we went right on the air and we told the whole story about Oswald got a lot of people who were writing in and saying things to us a lot of folks didn't like the United States saying things that this was you know showing the gangsterism that prevailed in our country but most of the people who would write to us and the, as I say there were a lot of people who were writing mm -hmm. from the from Europe from all over the Middle East. Uh, they were very supportive of the United States and frankly, very empathetic to what we were facing at that time. I, that surprised me. Yeah. Was there an anti-Dallas sentiment specifically because this was all happening here? No, not really. And, and uh, that thing, uh, that came a little bit later, I think. There had been trouble in Dallas, as we all know now, just prior to, to Kennedy coming here. Mm -hmm. But, um, that was not publicized overseas mm -hmm. and uh, so no dallas itself uh, aside from obviously being the place where all of this took place uh was not uh, there, there there was nothing that was negative that was said about dallas per se during the course of that weekend barely sleeping always on the air was there a particular moment when the enormity, the historical significance of this hits you as an individual rather than a broadcaster? Well, I think it was with us through the whole thing. Uh, we, we had, I think, a real sense. Most of us had been well trained. Most of us had been fairly well educated. It was, and, and most of us had studied things like, you know, international affairs and so forth. So the impact, the gravity of the situation did hit us. But the time I think that it had the most impact on me personally and the, and the uh, emotional uh, thing that I felt was uh, when we were running the tapes of the Kennedy funeral and uh, uh, John John had stepped out to salute his dad. So a very emotional moment. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Now, it, because you were overseas and so many people of your generation have these extraordinary vivid memories of the assassination, this touchstone which defined a generation, do you feel a certain amount of detachment because you weren't able to just sit down in front of a television and watch the whole story unfold here in the States? Uh, you know, I, I really didn't have that. We, we, uh, we were very fortunate in that we had all this wire stuff that was coming in, so we were able to read a little bit of everything. And I felt very deeply involved uh, because of the reaction that we had, because of the people who were descending on us. Uh, and because suddenly the base became a very important place and our commanders were in direct contact with the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of activity surrounding us and we did feel very deeply involved with the whole thing. And so then we have about 10 or 11 years after the Kennedy assassination, you, you arrive here in Dallas where it happened. Who would have thought? <laughs> and you, uh, you join uh, the ABC affiliate WFAA originally as an investigative reporter. I did, yeah. And, and you covered a number of stories, some assassination related, but specifically in the late 70s when the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the second major government investigation, began to look into things, you did a little coverage of their uh, visit to Dallas, their reenactment. Can you 
recall any of that? Yes. Well, yeah, actually, it started off, they'd sent me, uh, Channel 8 had sent me to uh, WFAA, uh, to Washington, D.C., and we'd picked up some of the hearings there and then followed it back here as they went through their, the, the reenactment, which, by the way, was carried nationally, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it was just kind of fascinating to see them step through all that stuff. The, mm -hmm. the Warren report had been widely criticized as just being a whitewash of what had taken place. And almost immediately, conspiracy theorists uh, were getting an awful lot of attention. And there was a whole cottage industry before it was all and still active today that was set up around um, uh, you know, the, the whole conspiracy theory. Uh, there were a number of theories. People were writing books and people were saying, you know, that the mob was involved or the Russians were involved or the Cubans were involved. But somehow this all, uh, to my mind at least, it might have painted an interesting picture. But I think that Oswald acted alone. And I think that everything that we did to try to show that he acted alone probably proved uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that he was... Uh, I say beyond a shadow of a doubt, obviously some still doubt, uh, but, but that he acted alone. I believe that he did. You've been here for a number of assassination anniversaries, the big ones being the ones that end in a zero or a yeah, five. That's right. Um, how has that changed over time as, as far as public interest in the site, in public interest in commemorating the 30th, the 35th, the 40th, and so on? Well, I think there's always been uh, a very active uh, presence. I mean, you can, in Dallas, people who are curious about this whole thing, there are conspiracy theorists who are probably right outside this building right now. And as I was coming in uh, this morning, uh, there were people out there taking pictures, looking at Dealey Plaza and shooting all this stuff. And that's the way, as you well know, Stephen, for the whole time since then, there was originally some talk about destroying this building. And then there was a huge hue and cry that came up in Dallas, but also uh, nationally to save the building, do something. And uh, thank goodness it did happen, and we've got the Sixth Floor Museum and all your good work right And, and we're here today because the building survives. But, I mean, you could probably answer that question better than I. Don't you fill this place up from time to time with people who are still all these years later curious? Well, it's interesting as our audience has shifted from when we opened in 1989, right. more people, two-thirds, remembering the assassination to now the opposite. More than two-thirds have no memories of 63. You get a different perspective and you get more and more young people, including some of you watching this today, who are interested in the assassination not because of the emotional loss of President Kennedy, but because of the mystery, the intrigue, the, uh, the the problems with the medical evidence and the unanswered questions about Oswald's background, and it just keeps persisting, especially with the release of the new records. That's and right. it, it, It's just a generational story that I think uh, continues to move forward, which is why accounts by individuals who live the experience are becoming, you know, so increasingly valuable to us as we move ahead to the 55th anniversary and, and beyond. Before we go to uh, Q&A, I do want to touch on one other thing. We, we often take for granted when we turn on a documentary about the Kennedy assassination, there is just all this rich footage, black and white news footage of, of eyewitnesses being interviewed on Channel 8, and, and, and we are very fortunate that that footage even exists today uh, because it actually was in danger of being destroyed in the early 80s. I want to show a picture of, um, this is a, a good old shot of a classic, uh, two real heavy, heavy uh, video video reel here, two-inch videotape. Uh, those things are heavy. And uh, what you're seeing here is just a very small sample of the original Channel 8 WFAA ABC affiliate uh, tapes that are in the collections here at the Sixth Floor Museum. And, and Tracy, as I understand it, in the early 80s, um, these were literally boxed up, put on a dolly, and marked for destruction, the original tapes. And if not for the... Uh if not for the actions, the very quick thinking of a producer at uh, Channel 8 at that time, a friend of ours, John Sparks, they probably would have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And uh, But he saved them all. We did uh, anniversary specials using some of that stuff. 
and they're priceless today. Oh, absolutely. In 83, at the 20th anniversary, John put together this sort of minute-by-minute compilation, uh, a lot of this unseen since 63, so 20 years later, and he got you to to come in and sort of narrate and host some of that. We worked together, of course. John was a a producer, a special events producer at that time, I think, at, uh, at Channel 8 hard worker and he had uh, gone through all of these tapes and came to me and wanted to know if I would help him write and narrate the thing and and I did. Mm -hmm. The Yeoman's portion of the work went to John. He did a magnificent job. Some place there that tape possibly right here exists of that anniversary special that we put on and it's worth seeing. Oh absolutely, absolutely. Now you have covered so many things in your career. You went to the Soviet Union and did broadcasting from there I believe. I did. Um, where does the Kennedy assassination fall within the spectrum of your remarkable career in journalism? Well, obviously, it's one of the things that guided me into broadcasting, as I'd mentioned a little bit earlier. I think that Kennedy still, for those of us who are a certain age, is still uh, a part of our conscious, uh, 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 certainly a part of our very living memories. Uh, and it hit us very deeply because he was a different kind of president, very charismatic. And those of us who were of a certain age at that time, many of us, responded to this man and responded to his family. And there was a reason that it was called uh, Camelot, you know. And um, all of those wonderful books that were written after Kennedy's assassination. He opened the door to a lot of things, including what became the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That was actually Kennedy's bill, and it would not have passed probably if he had lived, but because there was so much sympathy in this country and in Congress, uh, Johnson was able to push that thing through, so we got the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Right. So there were positive things. It's hard to put it uh, in, 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 in that kind of context, but there were positive things that happened after that, probably because there was such great depth of feeling Mm -hmm. uh, for Kennedy. And at at the same time, the assassination is credited with ushering in a lot of that skepticism in the government and violence associated with Vietnam and and the 60s. So so it is a double-edged sword. You know, when you it's it's difficult to look back on history like this and wonder what might have been because Kennedy is infused with such unfulfilled hope and and promise. But that's that's what we do is try to interpret that. You know, he uh, was president when we first started sending people into uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But it's been well documented that he had taken a second look at that and he wanted to get us out of Vietnam. And possibly he would have done that and we wouldn't have had that long, very costly war. Uh, And I lost a lot of friends in that war and and, uh, maybe some of the teachers especially, maybe some of the students who are watching now lost parents and so forth. Mm -hmm. Devastating war that perhaps wasn't necessary at that time. We could have gotten out of it. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that comes to mind, Stephen, is we brought, you would mentioned my uh, trips to the Soviet Union, we had established a communication with the former uh, uh, Soviet communist uh, journalists Mm -hmm. as well as lawyers and we did an exchange program and brought a bunch of those people to Dallas they were very much interested in visiting here and they assembled here and I remember that uh, we had some of the folks had been very actively involved as reporters who turned up to talk to them but the question was asked how many of you believe that there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy and coming out of that background, that culture, everyone in the room raised a hand. There was, uh, out of those people, there were probably 20 people in the room, but the very well-educated journalists and lawyers, and every one of them um, believed that Kennedy had been a part of it, died because of a conspiracy. I wonder how many of those same people thought Khrushchev or Castro was involved in that conspiracy. Well, I don't know. I, as I recall, they probably wouldn't have said at that time. <laughs> Uh, perhaps they would today. Well, we want to go ahead and move to our, our Q&A portion. We have a number of schools, as I said, uh, watching, and some will be participating today. I'm just going to go down the line here, and I'll call out the name of your school. If you will, unmute your mic and ask uh, just a question or so, and we will answer that and move on to the next school. So we will start with uh, uh, Texas A&M International University in Laredo, Texas. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Rollett, thank you, and uh, happy Veterans Day. Thank you for your service and thank your you. sacrifice. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm looking at our audience, and uh, do we have any questions, you guys? <laughs> Sorry, we, that, at this point, oh, we have one question in the back. Um, with Trump's uh, wanting to release the new documents and everything that he's been wanting to do, like, what are your thoughts about him releasing more, more of the documents that have been like covered up, um, so to say? Well, I, I, it's actually it's a very good question. The the uh, the government actually had decided that some of these things would be uh, kept secret over a period of time, and the time had come for them to be released. Uh, this was just one batch. We're going to get some others in what another six months, I think. Mm -hmm. The other things will be released, uh, but it, uh, President. Trump didn't actually, uh, he, it wasn't because of Trump that these things were released. I suppose he could have stepped in and, and said, no, we won't release any of them. But um, yeah, I mean, I think oh, it's time. Uh, I think that it's time that we took a look at any files now on the Kennedy assassination that we haven't been able to take a look at before. I think we should now. Now I would mention that I said that I think that Oswald was the lone gunman. There was nothing, at least in this first series of, uh, of documents uh, that indicated otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what else is out there, but I'm eager also to find out. It's a good question. Yeah. The interesting thing about these documents is come April of next year, unless any are withheld indefinitely, all of that material will be out there. That's so there, right. won't be, there, won't, there won't be an excuse. There won't be the ability to say the government is hiding files uh, from us. It'll all be out, all be publicly accessible, and that's a really remarkable thing more than half a century after the death of President Kennedy. Great question. Uh, thank was. you. Thank you so much, uh, Texas A&M. We're going to move on now to um, Elsick High School in Houston, Texas. Do you have a question for us? Unmute your mic and and we'll we'll chat. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. What what question do you have for Mr. Rowlett about, about his story today? How has the Air Force impacted your life? Well, it's another good question. Uh, the Air Force, at the time that I went in, I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done to myself? But it turned out to be one of the most positive things. And in, in my time, the, the, we still had a draft uh, and I think most young people felt as though they had a commitment to their country. A lot of folks went into the Peace Corps. Um, and if you weren't in college or you didn't have a deferment for one reason or another, uh, you were going to face a military commitment. So I chose to, uh, I'd originally thought about the Marine Corps and then I thought, no, I, I want to do something else. And I had a chance to do uh, newspaper work if I had, by going into the uh, Air Force. So that's what I did. I don't regret it at all. In many ways, it was probably uh, one of the most positive overall experiences that I've had. Mm -hmm. uh, met some interesting people, very good people, worked with some great professional people in uh, both print and in broadcasting as well as elsewhere. And it, uh, I got to travel and see the world as a very young man. It was a very exciting time for me. It's a good question. and. Uh, I think maybe we lost something because uh, we went to the all-volunteer army. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks I worked uh, with had been drafted, and uh, I think that probably they were pleased by the experience. Mm -hmm. Let's let's jump back to the beginning one last time. Texas A&M uh, International University in Laredo. Do you guys have one more question to uh, finish out our program today? We, we do. Great. Um, how do you feel when like Donald Trump like threatened and saying stuff to like North Korea? Do you think we might have another war? Well, I hope we don't, but I do think that words matter, and I think that with uh, what's happening, we're seeing now that uh, the president has uh, been in China. He's hoping that China will step in and help uh, help cool down this situation. But I think that obviously the United States at some point is going to have to do something. We can't have uh, a hostile, nuclear-powered uh, government uh, right there on the Korean Peninsula. It's just going to be impossible. We can't tolerate that. We have too many allies in the area. So I think that something will have to be done, and I do not agree with the president's rhetoric. Mm -hmm.
If, if, I, if I can ask an additional question, um, sure. as a reporter or a journalist, how do you feel that the media is doing these days mm -hmm. in reporting those kind of issues? Are, are we doing that. a good job? Or? I think that's another excellent question. Uh, the media has changed an awful lot since I was in it, and I was fortunate, and I worked across media. I was in newspapers, magazines, radio and TV. Um, there was a time when a lot of the things that we did were, I think, to to uh, us at least, were sort of held sacred. We tried to remain objective. We tried to uh, tell the whole story as we could find it. And we tried, I think, to even pick up subjects that maybe were sometimes a little dull. You know, city council meetings may not be the most exciting thing out there, but it's important to local communities. Well, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, there's not a, uh, there's not a, a, a station in town that today has uh, a city hall reporter per se. We used to assign beats. Uh, I'm not real pleased with what I see in media today, to be honest, but I think that the other part of the problem might well be in the classroom because a lot of folks who are teaching classes uh, are not teaching what the First Amendment and the Fourth Estate really means in keeping us free. And I think we have to have a free exchange of information. We have to know what's happening before we can make rational decisions at the ballot box. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry to see this kind of uh, fake news uh, allegation that's made out there by the president. Uh, I would disagree vehemently with him. I think uh, that what he says regarding uh, news today is, is a bad thing for, for those of us who are news consumers. But I'd also say that I understand why people uh, today will also criticize media. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, it's deserved. When you retired in, in 2008, one of the local newspapers ran a little story about you, and I remember they wrote that Dallas was losing the last of its great stalwart Cronkite-esque broadcasters in the same vein as Walter Cronkite, Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings, and I, I couldn't agree more. Anytime I turn on the TV or more often pick up my phone to watch the news, I miss voices like yours, and I'm grateful that we had oh, you thanks, for as Steve. long as you had. This man is a true local living legend, and we thank you for your well, service, and we thank you for your time today. So please join me in uh, thanking Tracy Rowlett for being our guest today. Oh, thank you. It was a great pleasure.